Consent motion for the Agricultural Bill. I'll ask the clerk to read the motion. <clears throat> that this Assembly endorses the principle of the extension to Northern Ireland of the Agriculture Bill as introduced into the House of Commons on 16th January 2020 and consents to the Agriculture Bill being taken forward by the Westminster Parliament. I now call on the Minister of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Development to formally move the motion. Mr. Speaker, I beg to move. Thank you, Minister. The Business Committee has agreed there will be no time limit on this debate to open the motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, this is a UK government bill containing some UK-wide clauses, some of which are reserved and others which touch on devolved matters. It also contains a small number of provisions specific to Northern Ireland. However, before I get into the detail of these provisions, I would like to explain the rationale behind Northern Ireland being included in this UK government bill in the first place. The main body of the bill is intended primarily to provide the legal basis for a future agricultural policy direction for England and reflects the ideas that were shared with stakeholders a couple of years ago in the Health and Harmony document from DEFRA. There are also elements within the main body of the bill that have a UK-wide reach as they are related to reserve matters, and I will come back to those in a few minutes. Legislative consent <coughs> is not being sought for either of these components, that is, UK-wide reserve matters or the clauses that relate only to England. There are five remaining elements in the main body of the bill that are UK-wide in the remit but cover devolved matters. And again, I will come back to these, and I am seeking legislative consent for these elements. Northern Ireland's, and hence my primary interest in the bill, relates to Schedule 6. This has three main objectives. Firstly, to provide in domestic legislation the legal basis for the full suite of CAP Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 options that we had prior to EU exit. Without this, we would not have the basis to continue direct support to farmers after this calendar year, nor would we have the option of continuing to make new commitments under Pillar 2 schemes, either current or modified. It is vital that we have these powers in place. Secondly, the schedule enables us to modify and to simplify and to correct the framework carrying forward uh, out of the old cap. It provides the additional flexibility should we wish to use it. Thirdly, it gives us certain keeping pace powers to enable us to ensure that we can respond to changes that might be brought forward elsewhere in the UK that could cause difficulties if we did not have the option. So Schedule 6 is therefore not designed to set up a new policy agenda. That is not its purpose. It is designed to provide certainty, stability, whilst we develop our new policy framework. <clears throat> it is to provide a degree of flexibility in the implementation of the rolled-over regime that we are carrying forward, and the ability to keep pace with changes needed to ensure the functioning of the UK internal market. The bill was originally drafted in the absence of an executive and assembly in Northern Ireland, but was developed so as not to constrain the ability of an incoming minister, executive and assembly to decide the long-term direction and the nature of future agricultural support in Northern Ireland. And this is an important point. Turning now to detail, it's those UK-wide provisions which touch on devolved matters first. These are Secretary of State's duty to report to Parliament on UK food security, Clause 17, regulation of fertilising products, Clause 31, identification and traceability of animals, Clause 32, regulation of organic producers, Clauses 36 and 37. UK's compliance with its obligations under the World Trade Organisation's Agreement on Agriculture, clauses 40 to 42. I will deal with each of these in turn. Clause 17 places a duty on the DEFRA Secretary of State to lay a report before Parliament on UK food security at least once every five years. While food is one of the UK's critical national infrastructure sectors and is reserved on national security grounds, it also relates to food and drink supply, which is devolved and analysing the statistical data falls to DERA. Clause 31 allows the UK to continue to legislate in respect of policies contained in EU Regulation 2019-1009 on fertiliser products. It provides for a continuation of the current regime, which applies to the whole of the UK, 
A joint approach allows for clearer and simpler legislative powers. Clause 32 amends the Natural Environment and Rural Communities Act 2006 to enable the Secretary of State to make secondary legislation allowing the Agriculture and Horticulture Development Board to undertake a new statutory rule <coughs> in managing a new livestock information service in England. Some of the functions which could be assigned to the Board include the collecting, managing and making available information regarding the identification, movement and health of animals or the means of identifying animals. These are devolved functions and the UK Government has indicated that it will table an amendment to the Bill in order to require the Secretary of State to seek consent before making regulations for Northern Ireland. Clause 36 provides the death of the Secretary of State and the devolved administrations with the power to make regulations in relation to the certification of organic products, activities relating to organic products and the certification of persons or groups carrying out activities relating to organic products. Clause 37 sets out who can regulate organics under Clause 36. This can be data <coughs> where it falls within the Northern Ireland's devolved competence. <coughs> Excuse me. As with Clause 32, the UK Government has indicated that it will table an amendment to the Bill in order to require the Secretary of State to seek consent before making regulations for Northern Ireland. Clauses 40 to 42 provides the Secretary of State with powers to ensure the UK's compliance with its obligations under the World Trade Organisation Agreement on Agriculture and makes regulations that requires Northern Ireland to provide information which is devolved and more particularly in Northern Ireland a transferred matter. The UK Government's initial view was that the provisions in clauses 40 to 42 were outside devolved competence. However, the UK Government has changed its position recently and as a consequence, I have led an amended legislative consent memorandum in the Assembly. Clause 45 is quite straightforward. It makes provision for Schedule 6 to apply, uh, of, the, of the Bill to apply in Northern Ireland. And this brings me conveniently to those small numbers of provisions which apply specifically to Northern Ireland, and these are contained in Schedule 6, which has been deliberately set out in this way in an effort to be as transparent as possible. Simply, Schedule 6 provides powers which will enable maintenance and modification of CAP direct payment schemes, modification of retained EU law relating to the financing, management and monitoring of payments to farmers uh, and the technical aspects, ongoing uh, support for rural development, collecting and sharing of data and appropriate data collection, intervention in agricultural markets, and setting of marketing standards and carcass classifications. And I'll deal with each in turn. Part 1 to Schedule 6 provides my department with powers to modify, retain uh, direct EU legislation, governing direct payments and support for rural development following the UK's exit from the EU. Importantly, it does not provide for the phasing out of direct payments or to have a transition period, which is a position in England. Part 2 to the Schedule 6 allows my department to give or agree to give financial support to agricultural producers in Northern Ireland. This would be the case where incomes are being or are likely to be adversely affected by exceptional market conditions. Part 3 to the Schedule 6 relates to the collection and sharing of data. It introduces a requirement for those in the agri-food supply chain to supply information about the supply chain. Part 4 to the Schedule 6 provides my department with a power to make provision about marketing standards in relation to specified agricultural products in Northern Ireland and to make provision um, about the classification, identification and presentation of bovine, pig and sheep car carcasses by slaughterhouses in Northern Ireland. Part 5 of Schedule 6 preserves the status of existing data protection legislation, including the gen general data protection regulations, any exercise of data will be compliant with those regulations. That sets out the provisions in Schedule 6, as I have said. They are few in number, uh, but nonetheless vitally important. And before I move on, I want to draw members' attention to the fact that the powers contained in Schedule 6 are mainly subject to affirmative resolution procedure, so their use is entirely a matter for this House, and members will quite rightly have an opportunity to scrutinise any regulations. Turning now to Schedule 7, Part 5, briefly. 
This part provides details of any consequential amendments to the CMO regulation in relation to marketing standards and carcass classification in Northern Ireland. It disapplies the relevant articles for products marketed or slaughterhouses situated in Northern Ireland. To sum up, it is my view that the Bill's provisions should extend and apply to Northern Ireland, and I commend the motion to the House. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Before I call the Minister to wind on the debate, in keeping with the new social distancing rules, people aren't able to approach uh, the table. I just want to make sure everyone that has spoken, uh, or everyone who wishes to speak, has actually spoken. There's no other member wishing to intervene. Okay, then I call the Minister to wind on the debate. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The Agriculture Bill is a UK Government Bill. The rationale for extending the limited number of provisions in Northern Ireland has always been to ensure the continuation of a legal basis that provides for the current suite of agriculture support payments having exited the European Union and to provide the Northern Ireland Executive with the maximum flexibility to develop future agriculture policy in Northern Ireland and ensure that no constraint is placed on the Executive's ability to continue the current schemes and options available. And without these powers, <clears throat> there could be problems in terms of making payments to farmers beyond 2020 scheme year or responding to changes elsewhere in the UK. So we do see this as a necessary piece of legislation. In terms of Northern Ireland agriculture, but I'm focused on ensuring policies are in place that will be good for the local farmers and provide the basis for an environmentally sustainable future. And this is likely to require primary legislation in this Assembly, which I will introduce at the appropriate time, subject to the Executive's agreement. And good policies and systems are a priority, and it's to ensure that we have a sustainable agricultural industry and that all farmers are supported on an equitable basis. And it, is the object it is our objective which will make a Northern Ireland agricultural build more likely. The Chair and others um, raised the issue of direct payments to uh, the farmers post-2020, and I am seeking to ensure that our future share of the UK agriculture bill budget will reflect Northern Ireland's current combined cap Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 share. And I have already raised the issue of future support arrangements with the Prime Minister and DEFRA Secretary, and indeed with our own Secretary of State. And my department is liaising closely with the direct Department of Finance to ensure that future needs of the Department are clearly identified and that future funding is maximised. And in relation to future years, the Conservative Party manifesto stated that funding for farm support would be maintained at existing levels until the end of this Parliament. While the schemes themselves may change across the UK, I am uh, hopeful that the funding levels will be maintained at least until 2024. That is a longer period than had we stayed in the European Union, as they are currently uh, looking at addressing funding, and it will almost certainly mean cuts uh, to the larger countries and the, the countries who have uh, been in the European Union for a longer period of time. And the accession countries will almost certainly um, have theirs raised, and consequently the countries who are more established will have their uh, support for agriculture cut. And I want to ensure that, in terms of having that sustainable agriculture industry, that we do have that equity. And moving forward, it is important to ensure that Northern Ireland farmers can compete with English, Irish, Scottish and Welsh farmers as we develop our own future agricultural policy. And we need to ensure that we have the ability uh, to design something which is fit for purpose for us, for um, the place that we live and for the people that we serve. I will also be keeping a close eye on future cap arrangements to ensure that Irish farmers do not gain a significant advantage over Northern Ireland counterparts. And particularly given the nature of our all-island supply chains, it is important to ensure that Northern Ireland businesses can remain competitive and operate on that level playing field against uh, competitors, whether it be in Ireland or European Union or elsewhere. In terms of uh, future agricultural policy, Again, this was raised by a number of members. The Agricultural Bill will provide the, the Northern Ireland Executive with maximum flexibility to develop future agricultural policy in Northern Ireland. And I am committed to ensuring that, moving forward, we have an agricultural policy framework that meets the future needs of the local industry, makes farms sustainable, protects and enhances the environment. And in this proposed framework, my officials, in conjunction with key food, farming and environmental stakeholders, identified four desired outcomes 
and long-term visions for Northern Ireland agri-food industry. These are an industry that pursues increased productivity in international terms, closing the productivity gap which has been opened up with our major suppliers, an industry that is environmentally sustainable in terms of its impact on guardianship of air and water quality, soil health, carbon footprint and biodiversity, an industry that displays improved resilience to external shocks such as market volatility, extreme weather events, which are never more frequent to and, and which industry has become very exposed, and an industry which operates within an integrated, efficient, sustainable, competitive and responsive supply chain with clear market signals and an overriding focus on high quality food and the end consumer. These four outcomes complement each other. They are outcomes that are broadly supported by stakeholders. Our focus now needs to turn on how we can deliver these outcomes. I have no plans at this stage to introduce a sunset clause with respect to the Northern Ireland provisions in the UK Agriculture Bill. Introducing such a clause could leave me with no legal authority to make agriculture support payments moving forward and remove powers for DERA to give aid in exceptional market conditions. That is something that we are currently looking at, given COVID-19. Uh, markets are changing very, very quickly. So we have lost all of the restaurant trade, lost all of the hotel trade, and all that goes with that. The consequence of that, for example, is that um, the, the, the meat processors are reporting that mince and, and four-quarter meat is flying out the doors. But the stakes aren't what account for a third of the, the, the value of the carcass, which would previously have been used um, extensively in, in the restaurant trade. So we see already a distortion in the market. The dairy sector is reporting pressures in prices. Um, lambs aren't being exported um, to the extent that they were previously as a consequence of this. And our fishing sector has, has been badly affected as they are heavily reliant um, on exports and uh, they, 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 their, their markets um, are not available at this moment in time. So we see how we need to have that flexibility to do such, and therefore it would be very, very foolish of this Assembly to introduce uh, a, uh, something into this bill which would hamstring the Department and the Minister in bringing forward proposals to this Assembly uh, which would be to the benefit of the people that they represent, uh, whether they be in farming or fishing. So, for that reason, we need to be very, very careful about going down such a route. I'm also determined to ensure that, uh, when it comes to the protocol, uh, which was raised again by, by members, that the UK's internal market functions effectively. Northern Ireland's ability to have continued and unfettered access to and from Great Britain uh, is maintained. That accounts for, for over 50 per cent of our trade each way, and it's absolutely critical that whatever we do, we do not allow this protocol to hamstring us in receiving goods from and delivering goods to our main market. And we're continuing to assess the impact of the protocol. Clarification is still required. And detailed arrangements will be uh, subject to discussion between the EU and UK government through the specialised and joint committee structures outlined in Article 165 of the agreement. This detail will very much depend on the precise nature of the future trading relationship between the UK and the European Union. And as agriculture policy is a devolved matter, I am very aware of the potential impacts there could be with regulatory divergence between GB and the EU. And this is not an issue which is unique to the UK um, agriculture bill and its provisions. In terms of um, environmental schemes, the bill will help ensure that we can put agricultural policies in place that will be good for farmers but at the same time provide the basis for an environmentally sustainable future. Mr Carl, um, I think regrettably, um, talked about uh, sustainable farming and, and then brought in the issue of, of, of these diseases that we have been hit with over the course of the last number of years. Let me just make it absolutely clear. There is absolutely no comparison, no comparison in anything that happens in this country and in the diseases that have been brought to our door by people who have the most awful practices. The wet markets in China are a disgusting practice, and that is what has brought this horrible coronavirus to our door. The avian bird flu allegedly started with people who were cockfighting 
in the Far East and who actually sucked the saliva out of the, out of the, the, the roosters after the cockfight. And that's how that was spread. Awful, horrid practices that should not be compared with any farming practice in Northern Ireland because we do uphold high quality standards. And in terms of that, we will seek to ensure that, in terms of what we do on our farms, mix them better environmentally and also sustainable farms which can deliver good quality food going forward. I think coronavirus has been a wake up call. Just a month ago, there were two officials, senior officials, advising in Downing Street, who were saying, we don't really need Britain to produce food anymore. What fools. What absolute fools. As we are going into the circumstances that we have over the course of the next number of months, we don't need, uh, and, uh, never, never before has there been a greater need since the Second World War for us to have food on our own doorstep good quality food, food that, uh, that, that we know has been produced to the highest standards. And it is absolutely incumbent upon us to ensure going forward that that continues to be, be the case, That's, which brings us to the issue of food security. And quite a number of you have raised the issue of having that five-year check on it. And I will um, indicate to the Assembly that, 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 that I will raise this with Westminster that I don't believe five years and this Assembly has, has indicated that uh, reporting every five years is often enough. Food security has to be something which goes very, very high up our agenda. There's a population of some 65 million here. We can feed around 10 million of them from Northern Ireland. Um, Ireland feeds a, 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 a lot more and it is absolutely incumbent that the high quality food that is produced in these islands, is utilised in these islands, and we rely less on imports from other places which do not produce food to the same standards, either in animal welfare, environment, or indeed in the welfare of their employees. And we should not be in a position where supermarkets or anybody else is drawing in uh, produce from these places which do not meet the same standards and then set that as the bar for prices and make then people who are working at home here in their own country work at a loss to compete with these people who are not operating to the same standards. Fertilisers was uh, also an issue that was raised by members and the fertiliser clause uh, will amend the, the Agricultural Act 1970 and provide for the continuation of the current regime and allow the UK to continue to legislate on fertilising products, and it was said that it is important that we do not lie, allow um, regulation to drive up the costs, and that is something uh, which I am absolutely supportive of. Uh, in terms of then um, a couple of other issues that were raised, uh, some people referred to parking the bill. Um, I have made it very clear that we cannot park the bill, and we will not park the bill, because that would lead to non-payments uh, to the farming community in 2021, and that would be a fundamental and gross mistake and error of judgment um, if we went down that particular uh, route. And, uh, Mr Carl also mentioned in terms of food being local and sustainable and uh, uh, moving away from, from what you have in the, in the large supermarkets. Whilst uh, that might be a desirable thing, uh, that will be dependent on the public. And it's good to see a lot of farm shops and so forth springing up and shops which are more closely linked uh, to where the food comes from. And those will survive on the basis of people buying from them. I remember as a young boy going down to a, a, a wee shop close to where my grandmother's was, about 10 miles from home, and mum would have a list with her, and there were three ladies, and they all were in, the back, in and out of the back, bustling around, getting the sugar, getting uh, the, 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 all, all of the different products, and so forth. And we done that on a, on a, as a ritual weekly basis. Uh, I can remember that so well. But the supermarkets come in and they took over. That wee shop's gone. And numerous wee shops like it are gone and the people who, who, who actually run them. So whilst it might be a desirable thing, uh, it's not something uh, which we have control over other than supporting local shops and supporting local businesses. And again, the message to me from coronavirus 
is we need to be looking at local. We need to be looking at how we sustain and support the people who actually work in our own country, who are providing jobs in our own country, who are doing things to a standard that we like them to do it to, as opposed to be importing from the cheapest place. We need to forget about importing all of these goods from um, various countries in the world who, on the basis of price alone, we need to be looking at quality and about sustaining people who actually pay taxes uh, to this country. So, In terms of it, um, I, I welcome the fact that most people indicate that they are going to support the bill today. Um, we can't afford any further crises. It would be an unacceptable outcome if, if we didn't put this bill through today. Um, and would have to explain to the farmers um, why we are not acting to protect their interests. They are actually working flat out at this minute, and I want to pay tribute to those people in the food industry. There are around 100,000 people, and they are continuing to work. And we have had some issues, and I welcome the fact that a lot of those issues that were raised last week have, were in a better place on them. Uh, there may be still some to iron out, but we are definitely in a better place. Uh, but we read our food industry, because if we don't have our food industry, we won't have the food on the tables. And if we don't have the food on the tables, that creates a whole new problem. And if we don't take the food off the farms, we will create an animal health crisis, which will develop into a public health crisis, and we'll also have a financial crisis. So, in all of that, it is not necessary. It is critically important that these businesses continue. They cannot be done without. So we need to ensure that that food continues to come off the farms and goes onto the tables uh, for people's forks. That is absolutely critical. And I want to pay tribute to everybody that is involved in terms of providing the food at this time when others um, are not able to work. We can't uh, indicate that we have not sufficient time. This House uh, needs to be applying itself to business. I would say this, when coronavirus is gone, and it will, it will pass. When that is done, we need to have an economy and we need to have a Northern Ireland that we can pick up on. There is not much point surviving the nuclear bomb if when you come out there is nothing left. Now, when it comes to coronavirus, we want to save as many lives as possible. That has to be our first and primary focus, saving lives. But on the back of that, there, having done that, we need to ensure that Northern Ireland has an economy left, that it has jobs left, that it has opportunities for people, that our schools can pick up once again, and that our hospitals can go back to normal and start to tackle the waiting list and all of the problems that were so evident before coronavirus. And it's absolutely critical that we focus in this assembly not just on coronavirus, and so we'll have to do that, that goes without saying, but that on other issues for Northern Ireland to progress beyond uh, coronavirus, that we are prepared, that we are ready, and we are doing work on those things. So I commend uh, this legislation to the House. I believe that it is uh, something which is positive and something that will help us keep moving forward even after coronavirus is gone. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the motion standing on the order paper be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. Contrary, if any, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The next